Let me ask you, do you know where you're going? And is anyone going to Jerusalem? Now, you may say, I want to go to Jerusalem. I'd like to go on an Israeli tour. Or I'd like to go see the Holy Land. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, are you going to Jerusalem? Strange as that may be, strange question. Let's break it down. Because we're speaking from the metaphysical, beyond the physical. So much of our spiritual life, we have to awaken is letting go, releasing the physical and awakening to that which is of the spiritual. That's why we are metaphysicians, moving beyond physical realms, physical ideas, physical ideas, the senses, the physical limitations. We move beyond in a spiritual growth that says we understand from a new perspective. So let me ask you, are you going to Jerusalem? Because today's text says they were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, and those who followed were afraid. Here we're looking at this text. It's not just really a story or a scripture passage giving us some sort of roadmap to some physical movement of Jesus going from one location to another. It has far deeper meaning than that. It's really a statement of their spiritual movement. For when we look at Scripture, we find every single word within the Scriptures having deeper meaning and deeper purpose for us to enfold a greater understanding of rich truth. So often we read it, read it literally, and we think, okay, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. Big deal. Do we care? You know, he's moving on up. You know, he's moving all around. He's traveling throughout Galilee. So what? What does that matter? Oh, wait a minute. We have to look at the depth of this passage and looking into it, which describes our, our own spiritual journey, that of attaining a higher peace of mind and soul, that which comes from the practice of an aspiration or desire for something more, that which comes from a self-mastery that has really allowed us to overcome all of our challenges within this physical world and live and focus and breathe in the spiritual realm. This is seeking the unknown, seeking that which is well beyond what we can see within our own eyes. It's seeking a wonderful destination, Jerusalem. Let me explain. Did you know that the Hebrew language comes to us in a unique way? Or when it comes to the Hebrew language, it's just more than a word about how men, how people make coffee. Get it? Listen to me. It's he brews. It's not a guideline for us on how to make coffee and who should make coffee in the world. Although in my home, I'm really glad that I would like to say, Robert, it's yours. It's he brews. Come on, make the coffee for us. It's more than that. Hebrews, understanding the language and going into the depth of it, it helps us unfold that there is a deeper meaning with each and every word, each and every letter that's been with great intention. It was designed, the whole language created to help people communicate with one another spiritual matters. Wow. Think about that. The whole birthing of the Hebrew language was that you might understand spiritual life and how to live it to its fullest. So every letter, every word is formed with great intention. Every aspect of every word is there having sacred depth for our lives to unfold something with greater meaning. And what an injustice we do when we read it on the surface level or read from a literal context because there's something very deep. Let's take the example of the word creator. You sang the word our creator. Creator does not signify a supernatural or distinct entity something up in the sky, something we're thinking about, this great creator. Instead, we're looking at this word creator, and it's really talking about the next degree that a human being should reach when pursuing higher knowledge. Wow, let's break that down. For the word creator is booyah. Booyah. I think we have it on the screen right there. It's pronounced booyah. Have you ever had anybody like creating something and they go, booyah? You heard that? That's the word Hebrew word creator. And we may think, oh, that was just some sort of slang word somebody's using or some sort of expression like, bam, I did it. Or, wow, look at this. Or like, what's booyah? What is booyah? Creator in Hebrew. And what is the essence of this word? It comes from two words, meaning one, the first word, come, and the second word, see. The word creator is an invitation for a life. Come and see. 
The creator is inviting. Everything about the creative spirit is inviting. Come and see. The scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the invitation. That's the power of the creator at work within our lives. The creative essence is an invitation to experience something more. For the creator in the wonderful work of creation was offering simple an invitation for us. Let's experience something more. Let's go higher. Let's go deeper. Let's look beyond the physical and see something that is rich and fulfilling for the journey of our lives. How important it is that we understand that as we look at these Hebrew words, there is something far more meaningful for our life. So let's look at the word Jerusalem. Now that we understand that each word has some depth to it and spiritual understanding that's to be gleaned, we look at the word Jerusalem and that name really means a habitation of peace, a dwelling or a place of peace, a possession of peace, a foundation of peace. So Jesus was going to peace, a place of peace, a centeredness, a foundation of that wonderful understanding of peace. I love the fact that Jerusalem was built on seven hills. We find even more symbolism there that speaks to us, the seven hills, meaning those higher locations. Because any time within Scripture, there's an idea of elevation. It's about you moving up higher and higher to a level of greater understanding and awakening. Jerusalem on seven high hills, seven being the number of perfection. So when we look at this scripture passage, wow, Jesus went to the place of perfect perfection in great peace. That's where he was journeying to. That's where he was headed. That's why I ask you, are you going to Jerusalem? Are you in your spiritual life setting the course to say, I'm headed for divine peace. I'm headed in my life in the direction of seeing this wonderful place of perfection within me, my own personal Jerusalem. I am looking for that. I'm headed in that direction intentionally. And every day I wake up, I wake up and say, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to this place of perfection and peace in higher consciousness and greater understanding. Today's text says Jesus was leading the way. Yes, our master teacher, our way shower, Jesus is ever unfolding for us the insight, the ideas of how to live that practical, positive, spiritual life that's taking you to this place, a spiritual place that you may call your own Jerusalem. And the disciples, those who followed Jesus' teaching, were astonished. In our world today, we find a lot of people who are astonished by the things Jesus said. Astonished by the power of his teaching. Astonished and amazed at the wonderful truth that's behind it that does unfold a perfect peace for our lives. A centeredness that's there for us. Oh, but then the scripture goes on one step further and says, those who followed were afraid. We find in our world too, those not only astonished by the spiritual direction that you're traveling, they may turn to you and say, well, wait a minute, I'm a little bit afraid of where you're going. I'm a little bit astonished at the wonderful power of your faith and your believing that you're living out your life, but I'm a little bit afraid about where you're going. You're stepping out a little bit too much into risk and belief and the areas of faith. You know, it's kind of like the world wants to see people of the spiritual realm being modern day Peters who are willing to say, I'll put one toe out of the boat, but I'm not going to walk on water. Just one toe out. I'll just tickle my t- little pinkies in, in the waters and just play a little bit, splash a little bit along the side of the boat. But I ain't getting out and walk. That would be too much. That's too scary. We might be afraid to step out in that kind of faith. So let's just have safe, comfortable faith. Those are the ones who are afraid to say, let's move out and let's be the people who say, I claim the promised land. I move out into the realm of the goodness of God. I claim it because I believe that it's all available for me and I'm going to get well, wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly out of the boat and I will walk on water. I'm not afraid. You see, we get afraid because we want to have control. But let me tell you this, and we look at around the control based on the five senses and the physical appearances around us, right? We want control. Well, I can't taste it. I can't see it. I can't feel it. I can't hear it. So am I really going to move out in faith? I'm I'm afraid. I'm scared. But let me tell you this. When you move out in the spiritual realm, 
you actually have more control. You know why? Because you've alleviated all the limitations of this physical realm. And there's more offered to you. As you move into the spiritual realm, it's the realm of you making choices. Saying, I will too will follow Jesus. To my personal Jerusalem. To my personal place of peace. Though the world around me and all the five senses would say, there's chaos everywhere. There's war. There's conflict. There's all kinds of division in our world, in our country. There's all kinds of polarization going on. There's famine and there's all kinds of disasters. How can you say that you're moving to Jerusalem, a place of peace? You see, we move beyond the five senses. and We follow Jesus, understanding that our perfect peace dwells within our hearts and our lives. And we're not afraid to move beyond the limitations, the things we see, to see beyond, and to see the goodness of God at work in all kinds of things. So let us go to Jerusalem, to that place of a perfect, higher understanding. Let us seek that within our lives. Because our spirituality is all about seeking, seeking something, coming with a desire for something more. And what is it we really want? Well, first of all, a lot of us want connection. We want to feel connected to something. We want to feel the power of making connection. When you come to church, I hope you make connection with one another. It's very powerful to do so. Connection on levels of personality and spirit and connection with one another's vibrational energy and the love that they share, how important that is. You want to connect with something more than just yourself in our spiritual life. What we want is connection with something bigger than us, something better, something that really helps us answer that question of what's my purpose? Why am I in this place, in this universe? And what am I doing here? Why was I born? Ever feel that you're at those places? Anybody, have you ever, have you ever asked those questions? Have you, have you, let's see some hands go up. Have you really felt that way? Wonderful. You know why? Because that's the beginning of the heart of a seeker saying, I want to know. I'm asking these questions. I want to feel this connection. Connection is so powerful. You know what it's like. When you actually make the connection between the cord on the toaster and the electric socket, you make that connection. The toaster works. It's wonderful. It's fabulous. You've got power flowing. So it is when we desire to make connection with the divine within our heart and our life. We say, I want to be connected with this divine power. I want to feel it surging through me. I want to feel and sense that there's something there that's alive that I'm connected to, not just hearing about. I want to tell you this, how important it is that we make these connections because we can come to church year after year, Sunday after Sunday, and hear about a lot of good stuff. But if we don't connect to it, plug into it, really make that connection, then we are never really finding the power uh, that we are seeking within our lives for a vibrant and effective spiritual life. So I really want to encourage you, seek out this connection within our lives. Because originally, our humanity really felt connection. We look at some of the old stories from the Old Testament, of people living in village, community, sharing together. There was a sense of one of people really feeling initially connected as if they lived as one single community or one single being. And that's really how nature treats us, because nature all around us sees us all as one, not as separated in any way, but all as one. All these trees out there, I want to tell you this, an arborist just told me that all these trees are interconnected in their roots and they relate to one another. And so the root system is spreading outward, connecting the roots of one tree, connecting to the roots of another tree. Your roots touching my roots as we were trees. And how wonderful it is to feel all this wonderful sense of living in a community of oneness. And in this great ravine alone, life sustains and cares for all different aspects. It's been created, uh, designated as a bird sanctuary. The arborist came and said, it's a bird sanctuary because it's just, all of nature is taking care of itself and sees it as one entity. So the birds are feeding off of the berries that are growing naturally in the trees that grow from the water that's coming through the streams that's nurturing from the soil that's all below. 
and so is this wonderful exchange where the trees are taking care of the soil and the soil is taking care of the trees and there's wonderful essence of taking care of the air and the birds and all of nature and according to our recent University of Tennessee students who were sleeping in the chapel, the deer. That's right, they saw deer in the mornings as they woke up in the chapel in front of those beautiful windows, they looked out, ah, deer in the ravine, all of nature taking care of itself. When we understand this, we understand this is innately how humanity was created, that we might understand that we work together and we're created as one. Not created as separate, but as a collective being. Here's another Hebrew word, Adam or Adam. Do you know what the word Adam means? The Hebrew word Adam means similar to or like the creator. You look at the actual Hebrew you think the very first man or the first of creation or humanity that was created that is symbolized by Adam or Adam, meaning that created similar to or like the creator, not separated, not divisive, but connected to in the sense that it's similar to or like the creator. You see, all of the scriptures have been unfolding a deeper meaning that we kind of read, oh, we just bypassed that. And said, Adam, Adam and Eve, first man, he just got a name. Who thought of that name, Adam? Where'd that come from anyway? We don't pay any attention without realizing the Hebrew symbolism that's trying to speak to us in a deeper meaning that says all that was created from the very beginning was created like the creator in the image and likeness for the purpose of understanding your true connection, not a separation but a divine connection, a connection with the very character of God. It's within you. Do you know this wonderful character of God that's love and grace and mercy, peace and compassion, joy and happiness, contentment is lying within you. It's a sleeping joint. We need to awaken the character of God. Wake up the character of God today within you through this wonderful spiritual connection that says, all of the forgiveness of this divine entity that we call God rests within me. The power of grace to be gracious with one another rests within me. The infinite possibilities of love and compassion, they rest within me. I just need to awaken this sleeping giant of this wonderful character because I am Adam. I am man. I am humanity. I am created in the likeness similar to the creator. The one who is inviting us to come and see something even greater within our spiritual journey. So how important it is that we embrace this wonderful understanding that we are living in a sense of oneness. Years ago, I had the opportunity of experiencing a oneness blessing. And last year, I became a certified oneness giver. Let me explain what that is. It's from a spiritual traditions of the ancients where people came and offered blessing, laying on of hands, as we might find within scripture, laying on hands with this wonderful intention to bless. Now, science will say that in this process of blessing, thank you for letting me use you as a demonstration model, uh, uh, how wonderful to put that beautiful blonde hair, lay hands on that. Huh? Uh, how uh, wonderful it is to experience this blessing. Science will say that it awakens the neurons within the brain when there is energy of another nearby, the very crown or the head, the crown chakras of the human body. It's our awakening that as if the neurons of the brain begin to dance. And in this prayer of blessing, it's a prayer that you are blessed with an awakening of that sleeping giant, that you are one, one with God. Awaken to this. Here's our whole challenge in our world. We're falling asleep every single day. We're slumbering in our journey. We're half asleep, kind of, slipping around and tumbling, stumbling around in, in this drowsy state of our spiritual life. And that oneness blessing begins, first of all, as we remove all separation or ideas of separation within our life. So to be a oneness giver, the first thing I was taught to do was I needed to forgive. I needed to release. I need to embrace love. 
I needed to see that there was no barrier between me and anyone. I needed to love my enemies. I needed to forgive all people. For how could I bestow the very character of God in blessing, laying hands on someone when I have all the issues that are blocking all of that within me? When I'm saying, oh, I really want to bless you with divine blessing, but really I can't stand so-and-so and I hate this person and I really have troubles with it. I'm not at peace with this issue or that person. You see, we can't bestow blessing upon someone else until we first release all those barriers within our own life. And that blessing comes from an awakening that first the blessing giver must realize, I am one with the power and presence of God. There is no separation. And that which I offer to someone else is the gift of awakening that they too are one. And there is no separation. An awakening of this great spiritual connection, this great connection that enables us to live out the very power and presence of the very character of God. Second aspect in our seeking is there's a seeking that says, I want something. Plato said that necessity is the mother of invention. And he was right. When we really say that something is necessary for our lives, well, we do everything we can to get it. No. When we begin to feel that it's necessary, we take time. We muster the energy. We develop the skills. We do all these kind of things that are necessary to see that it happens because the necessity, the desire is there, and it is the mother then of all the creative energy, the mother of invention, the mother of things happening within our lives. And we become seekers. I love the story at Christmas time of the wise men who followed a star. They took the time. They made the effort. They mustered up the energy and developed all the necessary skills to go and follow the signs that led them to the Christ child. How important it is then we too become this kind of seekers that said, I want something within my life. And it's a necessity. And I'm willing then to make it a priority. And I'm willing to make uh, adjustments in with my schedule because what I want is to go to Jerusalem. I want to walk the journey to that foundation of peace. I want to travel to that habitat of wonderful peace. I want it in my life. And I will do whatever it takes to be that person who has found and discovered the pathway to a personal Jerusalem within my life. You see, the scripture is finding, uh, showing us ways that we might embrace this. And let me suggest that more than becoming a spiritual seeker, how about we become a spiritual finder? Finder, that's right. The other day, someone stopped me, and they were in an evangelical mood and said, have you found Jesus? And I said, wait, did you lose him? What, what? Because so often people are asking us, did you find him? Did you find him? Did you find him? As if Jesus was lost somewhere. And we've got to go out and hide for him. Somehow, everybody, let's get in the car. We've got to go find Jesus. Wait a minute. It's not that Jesus is lost. It's just that we haven't found that which is already there in front of our face. How many of you are looking for your glasses only to find that they're on your top of your head? We've all been there. You can explain that, relate to that experience. So it is within our spiritual life that sometimes we're looking for all the goodness of God and we don't realize it's right there in front of us. And we, it's not been lost. It's something that we need to find. And so what we have to do is become a spiritual finder. For scripture says, seek and you shall find. Seek and you shall find. So we begin as that seeker and move then to the finder that we're called to be. For that seeking then is something that's happening going deep and inward within our lives. Because everything else around us in this world are just mirrors and reflections of what's going on inside of you anyway. So if we're looking for that perfect peace, let's start looking and find it within. Not looking outward, say, would you give me peace? Would you give me peace? I'm trying to find Jerusalem. Would you show me the way? Someone else show me the way. Someone needs to stop you and say, Jerusalem's right within you. Perfect peace is to be found within you. Stop looking for everything else. Stop searching high, low, here, there, everywhere, and only discover that it's already there within you. And that the wisdom of God is there. 
The next aspect of our seeking and our spiritual journey, of our getting to Jerusalem along this pathway, is that of a self-mastery. Mastering that self that wants to always get in the way of our spiritual growth and development. For how do we make spiritual progress? Well, we really do it in this wonderful understanding of overcoming, mastering that individual, that self within us. That I that says, wait a minute, that ego that wants to be in control of so many things and mastering it in a powerful way. For the individual that realizes that he's living a life or she's living a life, not what I can get out of life, but what I can put into life is the one who have, has embraced a self-mastery. Think about that. It's not what, what I can get out, what I can put into. Well, wait a minute, I, I don't have anything. Oh, again, we haven't been to Jerusalem, that place of perfect peace within, to realize we have everything. We haven't awakened that spiritual slumbering giant that's waking in, and that's the very character of God that says, you have everything within. It's not that it's lost. It's there to be found. And so we wake and then we realize, wait a minute, I have a lot of things to give. I have so much to give to this world. I'm not asking what the world will give to me. I'm asking what can I put into the world? And that's the beginning of our spiritual awakening is this wonderful discovery that I am here to receive and to receive to give. This is a big transformation in our lives when we realize how important it is that our life is all about receiving from the divine to give back into this world. Because the creator, that which is God, that which is this wonderful spiritual entity in this world of love and grace, desires to give, and its greatest joy is, I want you to receive. I want you to receive something. But as you receive it, I want you to give it back and share it because I want to create this wonderful energy of flow within you. There's a transformation that must happen in our spiritual life when we're seeking and finding, when we're traveling to Jerusalem within our own lives, and that's desire to receive, not for the self alone, the desire to receive, to share. I want to share everything we have. How important it is that we awaken to this. This is how we live that highest and best in our spiritual life. Share everything you've got. Have you ever thought about tithing on your car? You've got a car. Give 10% back. Oh, I'm not saying cut off the engine or take a few tires and throw them away. Give them away. I'm not saying share your trunk. I'm saying share the vehicle. Give someone a ride. Pick somebody up. Saying this is what I've received. I want to give back. How about your home? Have you ever thought about sharing your home? Thinking, is there some way I can share the hospitality of my house? Invite people over. Have some fellowship. Share your home in some way. Share the things that you have that you've been blessed with in life because as you understand that the importance of receiving is there for the spirit of generosity to be lived out. I'm going to tell you this. If we all went home today and went, opened up our refrigerators and took out those little Tupperware coffins where food goes to die and began to open them up and share I'm sure we could feed the multitudes. We all have so much. We are blessed with so much. We've received, but did you realize the intention of the whole design of divine flow was to receive for the purpose of sharing? When you receive spiritual truth, when you get spiritual insight, what's it there for? For you to hold on to and keep? to hoard and say, oh, I've got these wonderful blessings. I understand these truths. I, a pastor explained something wonderful for me for the scriptures. You're called to share. That's why the scriptures go into all the world and teach and preach the gospel, preach this good news, share it with someone else. How important it is that we engage in conversations that we're sharing the goodness of that which we receive with others. This is so important. Let me say, are you on the way to Jerusalem? Because that pathway is one of astonishment. It's one as we follow the teachings of Jesus who's showing us the way will reveal incredible spiritual insight. And you will feel that perfect habitation of peace. It will be there. For the creator is always saying, come and see, taste, partake. Come and see this goodness that's there. 
For this is the unfolding of truth. And today, the scripture is inviting you to go with Jesus to Jerusalem. Amen.